cool. All right, so do we start or should I, should I wait? I think, I, I don't know. Do I start? Uh, I guess you could. There's only 16 people, sure. All right, so hi everyone. My name is Salha. I'm a fourth year medical student. Um, and today I will be giving you a short lecture on bone physiology, inshallah. Um, I know you guys have your OSB tomorrow, I think. So inshallah, this is going to be a really simple lecture. I don't want to overburden anyone. I know that the, the lecture that you originally took for this bone physiology um, thing was, was kind of dense. So I tried my best to make it really simple. Inshallah, it's going to be really easy. It's not that hard. It's pretty simple, honestly. Um, but yeah, and all the best for your OSB tomorrow. All right, so let me just get into it. All right, so the objectives of this um, session are going to be first, I'm just going to introduce you guys to bone physiology because, as always, it's really important that you understand the terms that we're going to be using, what we're talking about before we, you know, we dive into it. Um, then I'm going to talk about the structure, the components, and types of bone. And then we're going to come to the role of different cells within the bone itself. We're going to explain the function of each, where each is derived from, and where each type of cell is located. So when we go through the bone cells, look for these three things, okay? The, the, where it's derived from, then the function, and then the location of each cell. Then once we've described the cells and we've explained their roles, we can come to the mechanism of bone remodeling. Because essentially the cells, the bone cells, are like the stars of the show when it comes to bone remodeling, right? So it's really important to understand the bone cells before we get into the remodeling process. Then we're going to describe the effect of calcium, phosphate, and vitamin D on bone regulation, resorption, and remodeling, and just basic things like that. And then at the very end, we're going to mention just very lightly, we're just going to talk about um, the pathological changes seen in osteoporosis, because I think it's just one thing that you guys just need to know at a very basic level. Also, I think someone's mic is on, so uh, could you guys just make sure that you guys are muted? Um, that would be great. All right, so intro to bone physiology. What do we mean by bone physiology? What are we talking about here? So first, let's talk about the bone tissue. The bony tissue is primarily made up of two things. You have your bone cells, and then you have your extracellular matrix. What is the extracellular matrix? It's the actual component of the bone that the bone cells produce, or they maintain, or they remodel. The bone cells do all these actions on the extracellular matrix. It's essentially the tissue that's within the bone itself. The bone cells produce this matrix, and this all helps in maintaining the bone. So what bone cells are we talking about? We have the osteoblasts, there's the osteocytes, there's the osteoclasts, there's osteoprogenitor cells, we're not going to talk about those too much, and then there are the endosteal lining cells. And when it comes to the extracellular matrix, what are we talking about? We're talking about specifically collagen fibers. So whenever someone asks you, what is the single most or important organic component of the extracellular matrix, you're going to say collagen fibers. This is by far the most important thing. And in bones specifically, we're talking about type one collagen, right? Now, the other component of the extracellular matrix is the inorganic component. These are the hydroxyapatite crystals. There are other things that go into the organic components and the inorganic components of the extracellular matrix, um, which we'll come to in just a minute. But for now, I'm just giving you a, you know, a basic point of view of, of everything. We're just, this is what we're gonna be talking about. And finally, the most important characteristic of uh, bone in general is that it's able to withstand really strong forces. It's able to withstand high pressure, it's able to withstand tension. And all of this means that the bone has to be really rigid and really strong. And it can't be elastic or bendy or stretchy or anything like that. It has to be very rigid and very, uh, very strong in order to withstand all these uh, you know, tensile forces they're acting on it. Another important thing, um, or rather something which helps it be become so strong, is the fact that bone is able to remodel. It's able to change. It's able to adapt itself according to the you know the weight that it has to bear. So it's remodeling itself continuously. This is something that goes on 
all the time. And it remodels itself based on the forces that are acting on the bone. So the cells that are old, they get old, they get replaced by new cells continuously. And all of this depends on the forces that are acting on the bone. You think the voice is kind of better without headphones? I don't know. I think the voice is better with headphones. Can you guys hear me well? Just let me know if you guys have any issues with, uh, with uh, hearing me. Um, if other people can hear me well, then it might be, uh, you know, maybe it's your sound system or I don't know. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So now coming to, yeah, now coming to the structure of bone itself. Um, what are we talking about when we refer to the structure of bone? There's four basic elements in any bone. The first is the bone cells, which build and remodel the bone. The second is the bone matrix, like we said earlier, which is the organic and inorganic components of the bony tissue. Then there's the bone membranes. We're not going to go into detail about the bone membranes, but what they are is basically membranes that cover the inner and outer surfaces of the bone. So if, like, if this is your bone, if this is your bone, the inner surface is covered by a certain membrane and the outer surface is also covered by a membrane. We will be talking about the inner membrane, but not so much about the outer, All right? And the fourth component of uh, the bone is um, bone marrow. And bone marrow is always present within the center of the bone. And it can be two kinds. It can either be red bone marrow or it can be yellow bone marrow. Red bone marrow is, uh, you know, stem cells and cell, red cell production, it's hematopoiesis and white blood cell production. All that occurs in the red bone marrow. Then you have the yellow bone marrow, which is basically just fat. It's adipose cells um, that are present alongside the red bone marrow. Okay, one more thing uh, to note is that the structure of bone, the components, the composition, and the organization of the bone changes depending on the type of bone you're looking at and also the maturation stage. So what I mean by that is, let's say there is newly developed bone, it's not going to have the same components as bone that is, let's say, two months old. Or, for example, if there is an infant, a really young person, a child, their bones are going to be different structurally when compared to the bones of an adult, right? There's gonna be differences. So it's just important to keep that in mind that bone composition can change depending on the type of bone you're looking at and the maturation stage. All right. So now coming to the types of bone. There's two types of bone that we're gonna talk about. The first is trabecular bone, also known as spongy bone, also known as campylus bone. I think in your lecture, he refers to it as campylus bone, but it's the same thing. I'm gonna be calling it trabecular bone. It's essentially the same thing. Now what it is, is it's usually present in the center of long bones and it is a lattice-like structure. So it's all these like tiny little holes of bone that are interconnected. Um, they form this lattice-shaped uh, unit inside the lamellar bone. What is lamellar bone? Lamellar bone is mature bone. It forms from woven bone. And when, it, when woven bone matures, it becomes lamellar bone. And trabecular bone is what you call units within the lamellar bone. Essentially, these thin lattice-shaped structures or this lattice structure itself is really important because what it means is this bone can now withstand forces from any direction. Because imagine you have all these connections that are making like a lattice kind of structure. Whatever direction the force is applied from, the bone is going to be able to withstand it because there's always going to be some kind of, um, you know, some kind of alignment there uh, that is going to be able to handle the compressive or tensile forces. And this is basically one of the most important things about trabecular bone. One of its most important characteristics is that it's able to withstand really large compressive and tensile forces in all directions. All right, the second most important thing about trabecular bone is that bone marrow is always located in the middle, the intermediate space between the trabecular bone. So you'll have trabecular bone like this with like a little bit of bone marrow in the middle. Okay, so trabecular bone only makes up 25% of the total bone mass. And if you think about it, this makes perfect sense. Why? Because trabecular bone is so spongy. It's literally, it has holes in it. It's very airy. 
So when you compare the mass of the trabecular bone in your body to the mass of the cortical bone or the heavier, denser, more rigid bone, um, in this case, the trabecular bone is gonna seem like it's very light. And, and it only makes, that's why it's only making up 25% of your total bone mass. Another point is that its surface area is greater than cortical bone. Why? Because it has so many tiny, tiny, tiny little holes. All right, so another important point, which is not on this slide, but it's important to keep in mind, in certain parts of the body, for example, the hip, the, the bone is very structurally dependent on trabecular bone specifically. That part of the body is very structurally dependent on trabecular bone. Now, let's say if for whatever reason, like osteoporosis, for example, the trabecular bone gets eaten up or it gets you know, destroyed. There's loss of bone density in the trabecular region. The cortical region is still fine, but the trabecular region is lost. In those specific bones, because they're so structurally dependent on the trabecular bone, this loss of trabecular bone is going to make them very vulnerable to fracture. And that is why in patients with osteoporosis, one of the most commonly seen factors is the fracture of the hip. Why? Because the hip is very dependent on trabecular bone. The majority of the bone in the hip is trabecular. So when the trabecular bone is destroyed or lost, it makes the hip very prone to fractures. Finally, another important thing is that there's always cortical bone surrounding the trabecular bone. Okay, so what is cortical bone? Cortical bone surrounds trabecular bone, and it is the homogeneous and dense cortical layer of lamellar bone. Lamellar bone meaning mature bone, and it always surrounds the trabecular bone. So if you look at this image on the side here, let me turn on the pointer one second. If you look at this image on the side here, this is your compact bone on the outer edge, and this is your spongy bone in the middle. Again, over here, your cancellous tissue or your trabecular bone, spongy bone, same thing, this is all right in the center and has the bone marrow within it, and it's surrounded by the more compact cortical bone. Cortical bone is also called compact bone. These are terms that you guys need to be really familiar with because a lot of the times your question might not say, oh, it might not specify cortical bone, it might say compact bone instead. So it's important that you know the different words that are used. In case of a trabecular bone, make sure you know that it's also called spongy bone. It can also be called cancellous bone. All right, so this is just an image that is showing you uh, the different uh, appearances of the trabecular bone versus cortical bone. Trabecular has so many like holes in it, spongy, it's quite literally spongy. And the benefit of this is that it's able to withstand forces from all angles. This is cortical bone. It's very rigid. It's dense. It is very homogenous. It all looks very similar. It doesn't have any holes. And essentially, that's the, you know that's the that's the major difference on appearance. Okay, now coming to the bone matrix. Any questions so far? Do you guys have any questions? All right. So let's get into the bone matrix. The bony matrix has two components. There's the organic component, which is also called osteoid, and then there is the inorganic component. So the organic component is essentially what is produced by, um, what is produced by the osteoblast. The inorganic component is also produced by osteoblasts, but in this case, organic refers to like the collagen and the substances like glycoprotein, proteoglycans, things like that, proteins that make up the bone. And then you have the inorganic component, which is all, almost entirely just minerals like calcium, phosphate, magnesium, and crystals. These are what form the inorganic component of the bony matrix. So the organic component, mostly made up of type 1 collagen. And like I said earlier, type 1 collagen is the single most important um, component of the bony matrix overall. Without type 1 collagen, your bones are going to be disorganized, they're going to be immature, mostly it's woven bone. And we'll come to that later when we talk about disorders of osteoid production, where the person is not able to produce type 1 collagen. Other components of the organic uh, portion of uh, the bony matrix include ground substance like chondroitin sulfate and keratin sulfate, um, and also glycoproteins such as osteocalcin and osteopontin. The bolded things on this slide are the most important ones for you to know. 
Um, so these are what you should focus on when you study. Osteocalcin and osteopontin are the most important types of proteins. Type 1 collagen is the most important collagen. Hydroxyapatite is the most important component of the inorganic material. Now, what is hydroxyapatite? Well, hydroxyapatite is actually a combination of calcium with phosphate, and they combine to produce calcium phosphate salts. Now, hydroxyapatite, this is the name of the salt that the calcium phosphate salts that are produced. And hydroxyapatite basically sticks to or adheres to the type 1 collagen fibrils that were produced by the osteoblast, the organic component. So here, your inorganic component is basically sticking to the organic component, and they form a crystallized structure, which again contributes to strength of the bone. It increases the resistance of the bone. Hydroxyapatite is very, very important, um, and we're going to you know, cover it again in a few slides. But for now, I just want you to know, keep it in your mind, hydroxyapatite is what? Calcium phosphate salt, hydroxylated calcium phosphate salt. There's other ions that are also present in the inorganic component, like calcium and phosphate, magnesium, like carbonate, citrate, potassium, and chloride. But by far, the two most important ions or you know, minerals necessary for your bones are calcium and phosphate. Okay, now coming to the bone cells. What bone cells are we going to be talking about? Uh, in this lecture, we're going to be covering four. However, there's three main ones that you need to know. Um, the fourth one is an additional one that was in your lecture, so I've added it. And this fifth, uh, fifth cell, which is the osteoprogenitor cell, I'm not going to be covering it beyond this slide, but just for the sake of your knowledge, um, we're just going to you know, touch on it a little bit. So there's three main types of bone cells. There's the osteoclast, osteoblast, and the osteocyte. And other bones include the osteoprogenitor cells, which are basically precursor cells. They form osteoblasts, which will then differentiate into other, other types of cells. But essentially, these are just the precursor cells that originate from the mesenchyme. And that's all you need to know about the osteoprogenitor cells. They form the other types of cells in the bone. And then finally, you have the endosteal lining cells. And as the, as the term you know, implies, they line the endosteal membrane, or the layer of endosteum of the bone. So let's say this is your bone. This is your bone. And this layer here is the endosteal membrane, also known as the endosteum. And this is where the endosteal lining cells are present, the very inner, you know, the inner layer, the innermost layer of that tube that I showed you. That is where the endosteal lining cells are present. Now coming to the functions, we're going to talk about each of these cells individually, but I'm going to just you know quickly go through them. We're not going to spend way too much time on these. For each of these cells, I will be talking about what they're derived from, the function of the cell, and the location. Um, so as I go through, you should be making a mental note of um, each of these things. Okay. Now first we have the osteoclast. The osteoclasts are bone carvers. That's how I remember them. Osteoclasts with a C, C for class. And they're bone carvers. So C for clasts and C for carvers. Now, what do they do? They are basically multinucleated giant cells that act as phagocytes. And they degrade and absorb the weak bone. And how do they do that? They basically produce two important things. The first thing is acid. They produce acidic material, which dissolves the bony component, the bony matrix. It dissolves the inorganic portion. Because imagine you have these hydroxyapatite crystals, and here is your osteoclast producing an acid like hydrochloric acid. It's going to dissolve those hydroxyapatite crystals. And that's the first thing. The second most important thing is the osteoclasts also produce enzymes. And these enzymes are what digest the collagen in, in the bone. So two things, acidic material for the acid and the, um, the uh, enzymes which digest the collagen. So what are the osteoclasts made from? They are derived from bone marrow monocytes. And their main function is to perform bone remodeling and bone resorption. Now, where are they located? They're located in two places, depending on where they're needed. So wherever bone remodeling or resorption is occurring, you're going to find osteoclasts there. And bone resorption always occurs in two places. If you're talking about trabecular bone, it's in the Hauship lacunae, 
And if you're talking about cortical bone, it's in something called the bone multicellular units or BMU. And these are specific terms. So if you're talking about trabecular bone, you're talking about Hauschild lacunae. And when we're referring to cortical bone, we're talking about bone multicellular units. All right, so here's an image just showing you a osteoclast. It's really important to remember that they are multinucleated and they're really big. So it's like a big cell with multiple nuclei that you can see within it. And it has these like ruffles at the end. It has this edge, which is like, like a frill kind of thing. Um, now, why is this really important? The ruffles are really important because when the osteoclast comes close to the bone, which it is going to resorb, the ruffles give it an extra surface area to resorb the bone. And they allow it to sit on top of that bone and come into very close contact, basically make like an area of sealed, a sealed zone, basically, where the osteoclast can secrete their acid, they can secrete their enzymes, and you know, perform the functions for which they were designed, basically perform bone resorption. And it is from this ruffled border that the acid is produced and the hydrolytic lysosomal enzymes. The acid did what? It dissolved the inorganic components of the bone and the lysosomal enzymes did what? They dissolved the collagen uh, or they digest the collagen rather. And this is a diagram just showing you the osteoclast uh, towards the very outer edge, and they're eating away this bone, and they keep eating as they go. They're basically like kind of like very hungry cells. Um, all right, so this is a slide just basically talking about what I mentioned. Um, they produce protons by the enzyme carbonic anhydrase. What do I mean when I say they produce protons? Like, what do I, what does that mean? They produce acid. That's what that means. Protons are basically H plus, right? And H plus is acidic. So they produce H plus and therefore they create an acidic environment around the osteoclast itself, around the ruffled edges, the ruffled border of the osteoclast. And this acidic environment is what allows for a dissolution of the inorganic bone elements. So the hydroxyapatite crystals, whatever other ion complexes were present in the bone, these are all dissolved because of the, um, the acidic uh, material produced by the osteoclast. Now, what is the enzyme that allows it to produce this acid? It is the carbonic anhydrase. So it secretes protons or acid, whatever you want to call it, for a dissolution of the inorganic bone elements. Now, what about the organic bone elements? For the organic bone elements, the collagen type one, um, the glycoproteins, the proteoglycans, all of these were the organic elements. When it comes to the organic elements, these are not going to go away with just acid. These need enzymes. So here, the osteoclast secretes enzymes, proteolytic enzymes, which will then degrade the proteins and the collagen and all those other organic components of the bone matrix. And the most important enzyme in this case is catepsin K. I think I'm pronouncing that right. I may be pronouncing it wrong. I don't know. Um, but simplified, it's pronounced CAT-K. And what CAT-K does is it digests the collagen type 1 fibril. So it is the most important enzyme when it comes to degradation of the organic bone elements. So far, so good. Do you guys have any questions? I'm just trying to, trying to you know, whiz through everything. If any, if at any time you want me to stop, just write it in the chat. I will check the chat. All right, so finally, after the organic bone elements have been dissolved and the organic component, the inorganic and organic components have been degraded, the final job of the osteoclast is to absorb whatever, um, whatever was left, right? So it performs endocytosis of the leftover bone elements, the products of the digestion, basically. All right, what else? The osteoclasts also perform, um, they also, or sorry, they're also activated by different hormones. And um, the most important in this case is parathyroid hormone. Other hormones that are also really important are estrogens and androgens. But for the sake of this lecture, we will be focusing on the parathyroid hormone. Oh, okay. One second. All right. Now coming to pathology. Pathology for osteoclast. What I mean, sorry, what I mean by that is just like um, a defect in osteoclast. What disease could that cause? It causes something called Paget's disease of the bone. And basically what happens is the osteoclasts get way too excited and they start eating away way too much bone. 
they are hyperactive and they resorb too much bone and they eat too much bone way too fast. And because of this, the poor cells that are trying to keep up with the osteoclast um, and they're trying to, you know, they're trying to build the new bone, wherever the osteoclast is eating away the bone, the, the osteoblasts are going to be trying to replace that bone, right? So these poor cells are not able to keep up with the osteoclasts. And ultimately the result is the bone that is formed is weak. It is woven bone, so it's immature, and it is disorganized, and it's not structurally sound. Basically, because of this hyperactivity of the osteoclast, it just kind of ruins everything. The entire structure of the bone is ruined. And instead of having one molar bone, you have woven bone. Uh, someone asked a question. Someone was like, can you please explain the difference between the inorganic and the organic uh, components of the bony matrix? So we're back to this slide. The organic components are substances that may contain things like, uh, you know, uh, OH groups, proteins, carbohydrates. These are all considered organic components. The most important organic component is the type 1 collagen, which is produced by the osteoblast. Other proteins that might be present, remember we're talking about organic things. So things like that have a either carbohydrate or a hydrogen or hydroxyl group, right? So these are proteins, proteoglycans, um, other like uh, ground substance materials, all these things that contain uh, carbohydrates, um, these are organic components. And organic components are everything else. So it's only the minerals, things that do not have carbohydrates, do not have proteins or anything like that. These are hydroxyapatite, so that's the crystals, the calcium phosphate crystals, and then the calcium and phosphate ions, magnesium ions, bicarbonate ions, all these other minerals that are present, all the minerals make up the inorganic component. Everything else is the organic component. I hope that answers your Bind to osteoclasts, which then cause um, the osteoclasts to be activated. And we're going to come to that in a few slides. But for now, when I, what I want you to keep in your head is osteoblasts produce osteoid, they produce the mineraliz mineral mineralization, which is the inorganic component, and they perform uh, uh, bone remodeling by regulating osteoclast balance. Now, where are these located? So they are located on the free bony surfaces of the periosteum and the endosteum. So coming back to my, my tube or my bone here, the innermost layer is going to be the osteoblast. They're right under the endosteum. And whatever bone they produce is produced from within. So it's like the osteoblast produce bone in this way. They produce it in this kind of tube kind of structure. And the layers are like concentric layers. So they form the outer layer first, then the inner one, then the inner one, then the more inner one, then the innermost one. And that's essentially how um, osteoblasts function. Um, okay. Now coming to um, just the disease associated with um, osteoblast uh, imperfection, or you know, uh, when when they're not able to perform their actions like they should. So the two diseases that we're going to be talking about are osteogenesis imperfecta and Marfan syndrome. So both of these, you don't need to go into too much detail when it comes to these, but all you need to know is they are characterized by defective collagen. So the osteoblasts in this case are not able to produce collagen type one like they should. And for this reason, these patients, they don't have the proper mature lamellar bone that they should have. Instead, they have woven bone and it is disorganized, it is not strong. And this is different from uh, Paget's disease. Because Paget's disease was what? Hyperactive osteoclast. In this case, you have defective osteoblasts. So the osteoblasts are not able to produce the collagen 
that they need to produce. There's certain genes that go into this, um, but you guys don't need to know that at your stage. Uh, all you need to know for now is defective collagen production uh, results in osteogenesis and Marfan syndrome. Um, also, osteoblasts have receptors for estrogen, which means when estrogen is decreased, osteoblast function is decreased. This becomes really important in women who uh, have gone through menopause, so they don't have any more estrogen being produced. And so osteoblast function is reduced, and so their bones become weaker. Now we're done with osteoblast, and we're coming to osteocytes. Someone asked a question. Uh, can someone can you explain the difference between osteogenesis imperfecta and Marfan syndrome? So osteogenesis imperfecta is caused by. I'm going to go into depth. You don't need to know it though. I think you take it in biochemistry, but I'll I'll just describe it a little bit. So osteogenesis imperfecta is a genetic condition where the bone is not able to produce uh, the collagen because of a defect in Col one A, which is a specific gene. Marfan syndrome is kind of like a multitude of symptoms. It's not just to do with bone, whereas osteogenesis imperfecta is solely to do with the bone. Marfan syndrome is to do with collagen and all sorts of things. It could, do with, it could be to do with collagen in the bone. It could be to do with collagen lining the vessels, blood vessels. It could be to do with collagen in, like your, in everything, in different parts of the body, whereas osteogenesis imperfecta is specifically a, a bone condition. Um, of course, each of these conditions has associated symptoms and other things involved, um, but you don't need to go into depth with that. Uh, but I hope that answers your question as to what the basic difference is between osteogenesis imperfecta and Marfan. Also, typically patients with like Marfan syndrome, they are very tall, they have very long limbs, and they can live a generally okay life. Um, they do have co co comorbidities and they're at risk for uh, dangerous, you know, dangerous things, but they're able to, they're able to at least, you know, live a okay life. Whereas patients with osteogenesis imperfecta, in some cases, these patients have such bad bone production that a single fall could result in like seven fractures. Um, often when these patients are born, if it's the most severe kind of osteogenesis imperfecta, these patients are born with fractures, sometimes as many as 37, 38 fractures, they're just, they're born with that. That's another major difference. Osteogenesis imperfecta is a very, is a very limiting disease, very debilitating disease. These patients often are really short as well. They don't have, um, they don't have, uh, you know, that tall, uh, that tall build. Um, their long bones are not properly developed. It's a whole bunch of things. Uh, all right, so osteocytes. Uh, osteocytes are bone maintainers. Um, so for each of these, if you guys can, try and remember like the one word that I used to describe them. Osteocytes were uh, bone cleavers or uh, they basically, you know, uh, destroy the bone. Osteoblasts were bone builders and osteocytes are bone maintainers. So these osteocytes, what are they exactly? They are osteoblasts that are located deep within the lacunae. So you know how I told you the osteoblasts start developing bone from the outside and they go inner, 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 and they end up with this tiny little tube. So as the osteocytes, sorry, as the osteoblasts keep building bone, more and more osteoblasts get trapped within the layers. Any osteoblast that is trapped within the layer is known as an osteocyte. So osteocytes are basically osteoblasts that get trapped within the layers of bone as the osteoblast is you know, producing osteoid. So as it keeps depositing osteoid, any osteoblast remaining here that's left underneath becomes an osteocyte. It is a star-shaped cell. And an important fact, an important uh, you know, fact about these is that they are connected to their surrounding cells by either cytoplasmic processes or um, canaliculi. Canaliculi are like these tiny little tunnels which connect the different osteocytes to each other and they connect them to other cells within the bone. Um, the exact function of canaliculi is not exactly clear, but what we do know is that canaliculi help provide nutrition to the osteocytes. That's just one of the many things that canaliculi do. They are derived from the 
uh, sorry, so yeah, so the osteocytes are derived from the osteoblasts, which get trapped within the bone matrix. And now their function, they do not have a function in bone remodeling. Instead, they detect when bone remodeling is necessary, and then they alert the osteoblasts, which will then carry out bone remodeling. So wherever a micro fracture occurs, or there is a tiny injury within the bone, the osteocytes are going to know about it, and then they alert the osteoblasts, which then start bone remodeling. So they don't have a direct function in the bone remodeling itself. And where are they present? They're present throughout the bone structure within the bony matrix, because wherever an osteoblast get, gets left behind and bone is deposited above it, that becomes a osteocyte. Um, okay, so coming to just one more slide uh, regarding the bone cells. I think there's just one more after this, sorry. So these little tunnels that you can see, these are the canaliculi, and these are connecting the osteocytes. These are your osteocytes. Again, in this image, this is your osteocyte here. This is an osteoclast, multinucleated, and your osteoblasts, which are on the edge of the bone. Now, your osteocytes detect changes in the canaliculi, detect different hormones that might be present through blood circulation, and they change your activity accordingly. Um, and yeah, just a reminder that they do not have a direct role in producing bone matrix or bone remodeling. They simply alert the other cells. All right, now coming to the last kind of cell, the endosteal lining cells. This is probably the most easiest one. Now, in this case, coming back to my, my cube, so this is your bone. The innermost layer of osteoblasts that is produced, osteoblasts are forming osteoids like this, the innermost layer, those osteoblasts, once they become inactivated, they become the endosteal lining cells. And what do these endosteal lining cells do? These are the housekeepers. So whatever, um, whatever remnants of bone are left from the osteoclast, these cells will go and they will just clean it up. Um, and they also activate the osteoclast by activating the rank receptor. Uh, they activate the osteoclast to start bone remodeling. So most importantly is their housekeeping function. So they clean up those little messes that are left behind by the osteoclast. And they also allow for mo more bone formation in those little areas, wherever there's like trash left by the osteoclast, they go in and they clean that up. Now, where are these present? They are always present on the internal surface of the bone. So once your bone is formed from outside inwards, and that's your tiny little tube in the middle, um, the osteo, sorry, the endosteal lining cells are going to be present in the very, uh, in the very center of that. Now coming to bone remodeling, we're done with probably half the lecture now. Um, bone remodeling, what is it? It refers to the load-dependent continuous remodeling of the bone. And what that means is the bone is adapting to the different weights that are acting on it. The forces, the tensile forces, compression, the pressure, anything that's acting on the bone, the bone will, um, will adapt and respond to that force and change its structure um, or, you know, re, uh, sorry, just basically refurbish itself to uh, better adapt to the force. Now, what cells are involved in this case? It's the osteoclast and the osteoblast. Are the osteocytes involved? Not really, except to alert the osteoblasts. Are the endosteal lining cells involved? Um, no, because they're basically inactivated osteoblasts that get left behind in the innermost layer. All right, now coming to the differences between cortical bone remodeling and, uh, what was it? Trabecular bone remodeling. Um, we're gonna be covering cortical bone first. Both of these are easy. I know these, I know these slides have a lot of text, um, but they're, they're pretty easy, so don't worry about it. So the first step, there's always going to be two steps. There's going to be a degradation step, which is done by osteoclast, and then there's a formation step, which is done by the osteoblast. What do the osteoclasts do? In cortical bone, the osteoclasts take a tunnel, which is called a basic multicellular unit. So they kind of eat away the, set, the bone like this and they form a really long, thin tunnel, um, which is done as a basic multicellular unit. 
Now in this tunnel, once the osteoclasts have eaten away everything and they reach the end of that tunnel, the osteoblasts now come in. They come into that tunnel and they start depositing the osteoid layers. So we're done with degradation. The osteoclasts, they carved a whole tunnel, a beautiful tunnel within the bone known as the basic multicellular unit. Now we're coming to formation. The osteoblasts have come in. They're now taking control and they're layering down the osteoid. They start layering down the osteoid from the outer layers of the tunnel. They start laying on the outer layers first. And once the layer is complete, then they move to the next layer, and the next layer, and the next layer. So the way the osteoblasts work is very systematic. They deposit the osteoid in concentric layers. And once they deposit the first layer, and they start depositing the second layer, any osteoblasts that are left behind will now become osteocytes. And this process is repeated and repeated until the tunnel starts growing like this. It basically is forming the osteoid is forming like this. And these layers are called lamellae. And the innermost layer forms the endosteum, which has the endosteal lining cells, the innermost layer of osteoblasts, that is. So this is the very last layer, very, very last layer in the center of the basic multicellular unit, which contains the endosteal lining cells. So here's an image that essentially just shows you what we're talking about. The osteoclasts were eating into the bone, right? Then the osteoblasts came in and they started producing more bone, the new bone. And finally, once the bone is formed, they reach their resting stage, which is the lining of the endosteum. These are the endosteal lining cells. Is everything clear so far? Do you guys have any questions? Before I move to mineralization. Any questions, you guys? All right, perfect. Okay, so mineralization, what is mineralization? So we talked about the osteoid, which is produced by the osteoblast. They produced collagen, and um, now we're talking about the minerals that they're going to produce. How do they actually produce the hydroxyapatite? This is done by enzymes. So these osteoblasts are producing collagen, and they also produce the vesicles. Vesicles are basically little containers of enzymes. These vesicles contain enzymes, uh, especially enzymes like alkaline phosphatase. So alkaline phosphatase in specific, how does it produce hydroxyapatite? How do we get from this resorbed bone that was eaten away from the, by the osteoclast to this new bone, which has hydroxyapatite? This is done by the alkaline phosphatase. So what happens is, what happens is, the blood that is flowing through the bone contains calcium and phosphate, right? Those substances that are produced by the osteoblast, they cause absorption of calcium and phosphate from the bloodstream. Now this calcium and phosphate is now has been brought in from the bloodstream and it's now in the bone. What are we gonna do with it? It's this alkaline phosphatase, which acts on this. It cleaves pyrophosphate and then uses the calcium and the pyrophosphate that it sorry and the phosphate that it received from blood and produces hydroxyapatite. This hydroxyapatite is then deposited as calcium phosphate crystals, and this makes up the inorganic component of the bone. So there's something called controlled mineralization, and what that means is there is controlled reabsorption of calcium and phosphate from the blood. They only, the, the, the cells only absorb as much as they need from the blood because they know that the calcium is ultimately going to be replaced. There was calcium that was removed when the osteoclast ate away the bone. And now they're only absorbing a certain amount of calcium and phosphate, just enough to replace the amount that was lost. And that is controlled mineralization. So they absorb a controlled amount of calcium phosphate from the blood. And then that amount, that calcium and phosphate, is used to produce hydroxyapatite, um, which is replacing the hydroxyapatite, which was eaten away by the osteoclast. So here you have your crystals growing, and you have your collagen fibrils, and everything is done. That's it for cortical bone. First step was what? The degradation, right? Eating away. Sorry. Yeah, degradation. Then we talked about formation, which is osteoblast, and they first deposit osteoid. 
Then once the osteoid is deposited, we move to mineralization, which was when they add minerals. Most important enzyme here was alkaline phosphatase. What does it do? Cleaves pyrophosphate. And then the calcium and phosphate, which are, which are produced, are then used to form hydroxyapatite. Okay, now coming to trabecular bone. Trabecular bone is relatively easier. In this case, there, there is no um, tunnel that is being formed. In this case, the osteoclast, osteoclasts kind of just eat away a small depression. It kind of looks like something like this. So imagine something like this. Your osteoclasts have eaten away the bone and you're left with sort of like a trough kind of thing. And it's called a Hauship cuni. And this Hauship lacunae is where your osteoclasts are present. Remember earlier I mentioned the osteoclasts are present in two places. It's either the Hauship lacunae or it's the basic multicellular unit, right? Basic multicellular units were for cortical bone. Now Hauship lacunae are for trabecular bone. So in this case, the osteoclasts eat away and they form this small depression on the bone surface. They reabsorb everything here and they form a tight seal over the resorbed area. Um, and what they do is they secrete all of their enzymes and their acid in this area. We already covered this part earlier, but essentially, I'm just gonna touch on it again. The acidity secreted by the osteoclast is for the dilution of the hydroxyapatite. And finally, the proteolytic enzyme, specifically catepsin K, is for degrading the organic bone elements. And whatever is degraded is then just reabsorbed or endocytosed by the osteoclast. And whatever is remaining, let's say there's leftovers, that is taken away by the endosteal lining cells. Um, finally, formation of the trabecular bone. How is trabecular bone formed? Exactly the same way. You have your osteoblasts. They come to your trough, which is, which is like this, your um, house ship, uh, you know, like you and I, and they start depositing their osteoids like this. Whatever osteoblasts, whichever ones get trapped within the osteoid, these are now known as osteoclasts. And when the osteoblasts reach the very top layer, the outermost layer, they become endosteal lining cells. Simple as that. Uh, this is just a diagram that's showing you. First, you have your resorption cavity, which is the Hauschild platuna. Then you have reversal. So the osteoblasts start depositing their osteoid, and more and more bone forms. It is mineralized, the whole same process as a cortical bone. And finally, you get to your resting stage where the uh, where the um, osteoblasts uh, become inactivated and they become endosteal lining cells. Everything clear so far? I hope everything is good. I hope I'm not going too fast. I hope I'm not going too slow. I might be going a bit slow. Okay, so this is a slide which just basically explains um, everything. In the description of this slide, I included many, many details on the differences between uh, the differences between uh, cortical bone remodeling versus trabecular bone remodeling. Someone's asked for a summary of trabecular bone remodeling. So the most important thing you need to keep in mind is in trabecular bone, uh, there is no tunnel. As you can see in this diagram here, there is this really long tunnel, which is which has osteoclasts at the very bottom of the tunnel, right? Now, in case of trabecular bone remodeling, there is no tunnel. It's more like a little dent, like a little hole kind of thing where the osteoclasts are just digging. And they dig a little bit, they form a structure which kind of looks like this, how should look you now? And within the structure, the bone is deposited like this by the osteoblast. I hope that answers your question. Um, how that works. Okay. Now coming to factors that regulate bone remodeling. Um, the most important factors are rank and rank L. Now what is rank and rank L? You're gonna hear these terms a lot, especially in, you know, in your future years, inshallah. Uh, but for now, it's really important to understand what they are. So what is rank and what is rank L? Rank is receptor activator of nuclear factor kappa B. Receptor activator of nuclear factor kappa B. R-A-N-K, rank. And this is located on the osteoclast and the precursor osteoclast. So the, the cells which have not yet become osteoclast, but they're about to become osteoclast. 
And let's, let's say this is your, let's say this is your rank receptor. This is a receptor. Now the rank L is the ligand, which fits into the rank receptor. And this ligand is present on osteoblast. So the rank L is on the osteoblast. It attaches to the rank, which is the receptor on the osteoclast, therefore activating the osteoclast. It actually, this, this binding um, causes two things to happen. The first is the fusion and differentiation of osteoclasts. The osteoclasts start you know, getting activated and they, they become activated osteoclasts and they start bone resorption. The second is this rank L and rank binding prevents the apoptosis of osteoclasts. So whatever osteoclasts are around, if their binding has occurred, these osteoclasts will now live longer and continue to perform bone resorption. Therefore, if I said that, oh, the, the amount of rank L has increased, what does that mean? That means that more and more bone resorption is now possible because there's more ligands to bind to the rank receptor on the osteoclast. This from the osteoblast, this from the osteoclast, they bind. And if there's an increase in the rank, rank L binding, then you have increased bone resorption. I hope that concept is clear. All right, now coming to another protein called osteoprotectin. Osteoprotectin is a regulatory protein also secreted by osteoblasts, which binds to rank L and prevents the rank L from binding to rank. So you need your rank out to bind to rank, right? But in case of uh, osteoprotegrin, it basically prevents that, it inhibits the action of rank out. So here you have rank out, more rank out, more bone resorption. But on the other hand, you have osteoprotegrin. More osteoprotegrin means that there is going to be less bone resorption because it's going to inhibit the rank out. So it blocks osteoclastogenesis or the production of osteoclasts, inhibiting bone resorption. It's important to have a balance between rank L and osteoprotegrin. If there's too much rank L, there's going to be too much bone resorption. If there's too much osteoprotegrin, there's going to be too much um, uh, inactivation. So there's going to be no bone resorption at all. And so it's important to maintain the balance. Now, both of these are produced by osteoblasts. Right? So this is the role of osteoblasts in regulating osteoclasts. This is how they do it. Um, this is summarizing what I've already said. And now coming to the different factors that go into osteoclast activity being increased or being decreased. So I want you to look at this table first. There's many cytokines that go into this hormones, drugs, and other factors. For example, parathyroid hormone increases rank L decreases OPG, which means bone resorption is now going to be increased. Vitamin D3 does the same thing. It increases production of rank L. And glucocorticoids also increase production of rank L. Osteoclast activity is decreased, on the other hand, with um, tumor growth, what is it? TGF uh, beta. This causes increased production of OPG. So there is lesser bone resorption more bone deposition. Estrogen as well causes increased production of OPG, more bone deposition. Vitamin K, leptin, bisphosphonates, and mechanical forces, they also cause increased bone deposition. Bisphosphonates typically are a drug used in osteoporosis. Why? Because they inhibit, they inhibit bone, uh, bone resorption. So in osteoporosis, your main problem is what? Loss of bone. So bisphosphonates are going to inhibit that loss of bone. Um, also, just a few more things about OPG. It is secreted by multiple organs in the body, bone, skin, liver, stomach, intestine, lungs, kidneys, placenta. And it's basically a receptor antagonist. I hope that much is clear for you guys so far. Okay, someone's asking me, how does the rank out increase? So the rank L increases based on different, uh, for example, different um, uh, needs of the bone. Let's say there is a greater need for bone resorption, um, or let's say there is 
a deficiency of calcium in the body. And the body realizes and stimulates greater bone resorption. In that case, rank L is going to be increased, causing more bone resorption. Um, so PTH, for example, when there's calcium deficiency, increases rank L. Glucocorticoids, also these are certain drugs, they also increase rank L and they decrease OPT production. Whatever, depending on you know, the body's requirements, rank L can be upregulated or downregulated, increased or decreased. And sometimes certain drugs can do it as well. Sometimes certain vitamins can do it. Various factors increase rank L. I hope that answers your question. Okay. Now coming to the final regulating thing, I think, of bone remodeling. It is MCSF, otherwise known as macrophage colony stimulating factor. I know we're going a little bit over time. I hope that's okay with you guys. Um, but we'll be done soon. I think we're you know, nearing the end of this lecture. All right, so this is secreted by osteoblasts and it promotes proliferation of osteoclast precursor cells. It basically allows activation of osteoclasts, differentiation of the precursor osteoclast into the mature osteoclast. Once again, it is done by binding with rank L. Rank L was on what? Rank L was from the precursor osteoclast. MCF is on the osteoclast. Sorry, MCF is on the osteoclast and rank L is on the osteoblast. Yes. Essentially, just converts osteoclast precursors into mature osteoclast. Okay, we're done with the majority of this lecture. The difficult part is over. Now we're just coming to basics, calcium homeostasis, and I think there's also vitamin D homeostasis. And then we're going to be done. All right. So what is calcium homeostasis? Calcium homeostasis involves a whole bunch of body systems, kidney, the GI tract, the bones, the liver, the skin, and multiple hormones as well. PTH is involved, calcitonin is involved, and vitamin D is also involved. And an important aspect is that calcium metabolism is very tightly regulated. So if you're ingesting a certain amount of calcium, the body only absorbs about 20, 30%, and everything else is excreted either in the stool or in the urine. And this absorbed calcium is very tightly regulated with uh, the, the calcium that's produced from the bone, because bone resorption is always occurring. So calcium is always being produced. So whatever calcium you're ingesting and whatever calcium you're excreting, all of the unabsorbed calcium, the unabsorbed uningested calcium, along with the calcium removed from the bone, which is excreted, must be in balance with whatever your dietary intake is. So let's say the dietary intake of calcium is very low. In that case, bone resorption is going to be increased to increase calcium within the serum, but your excretion is going to be decreased to maintain that level of, of um, you know, low dietary intake and low excretion. This is very important. Um, so just random facts about calcium homeostasis. Uh, you guys can read these on your own. It's very straightforward. It's just talking about the percentage of calcium in the body, percentage in the bone, um, the different types of calcium that is available in the serum, and the total serum concentration, 2.1 to 2.6, just some simple things like that. Okay, now coming to the regulation of bone resorption. Uh, by both calcium and phosphate. We're going to cover calcium first, then we'll get to phosphate. All right, so what does calcium do? Let's say calcium is decreased. This immediately will alert the parathyroid cells that calcium is low. So the parathyroid hormone is going to... The parathyroid hormone is going to immediately increase in response. And now the parathyroid hormone acts on three things. It acts in the bone to increase bone resorption so that more calcium is secreted. More calcium is released from the bone and goes to the serum. Number two, it acts on the kidneys to decrease absorption, uh, sorry, to decrease uh, excretion of calcium. Less calcium is excreted by the kidneys, more is retained, more is reabsorbed. And that's the second function. The third function is PTH indirectly increases absorption of calcium from the GI tract. 
So what it does is it actually increases vitamin D. And vitamin D will then cause an increased absorption of calcium from the GI tract. The three most important places of PTH, these are very important to remember as they're often as. First one is bone resorption, it acts on the bone. Second is acts on the kidney. The third is it acts on the GI tract. However, one side effect is when PTH acts on the kidney to increase calcium reabsorption, it causes a decrease in phosphate reabsorption. More phosphate is excreted. So in this case, however, the patient's serum phosphate level stays the same. Why does it stay the same? Because remember the bone is releasing phosphate and calcium. So even though there's phosphate being excreted, it's not going to decrease the phosphate levels within the serum too much. Why? Because there is phosphate coming in from the bone. It was a serum calcium that was low, which needs to be retained. The serum calcium is increasing and phosphate is, is, is being maintained because there is receival of phosphate from the bone and there's excretion of phosphate in the kidney. So both are, both are occurring at the same time, therefore maintaining the phosphate level. Now what happens when phosphate is low? So two things. The first is FGF or fibroblast growth factor 223 is decreased, which directly causes the kidneys to increase phosphate reabsorption. The second thing is it causes an increase in vitamin D, kind of like what the PTH hormone was doing here. Why does it do that? It does that because in order for phosphate in the blood to increase, it needs to be uh, reabsorbed in the kidneys. But if there's high PTH, let's say if calcium is low, if there is high PTH, PTH is going to cause excretion of phosphate. So in order to stop that, first, you have to make sure the calcium levels in the blood are optimum. So you increase vitamin D3 and you increase your serum calcium uh, as a consequence of increased vitamin D3. You've increased GI absorption of phosphate and then your parathyroid hormone goes down. When PTH goes down, then there is increased reabsorption of phosphate in the kidneys. Serum phosphate goes up, and that's how that is maintained. Now, in both cases, it's important to understand the consequences of what happens whenever there is low serum calcium or low serum phosphate. In both cases, bone resorption is increased. But how is the serum level of those minerals restored? That is important to differentiate. So in calcium uh, deficiency or low calcium, low serum calcium, you have increased calcium kidney work absorption, where you, whereas you have a, you know, more excretion of phosphate. And the opposite is true if your serum phosphate is low. Uh, so vitamin D, coming to vitamin D, vitamin D causes hypoglycemia if it is deficient. Why? Because it's necessary for absorption of calcium. So if you have a low vitamin D, you're gonna have low absorption of calcium. Your entire serum calcium is going to be low. Uh, serum phosphate is also going to be low as a consequence of the increased parathyroid hormone. Um, and this could be because of dietary deficiency. It could be because of you know, uh, poor absorption of vitamin D. There are many reasons why someone's vitamin D could be low, but essentially this is what happens. Vitamin D decreases, your serum calcium is going to decrease because there's decreased absorption of calcium and phosphate. So because there's decreased serum calcium and phosphate, PTH increases, which means there's greater bone resorption. There is uh, more uh, phosphate excretion through the kidneys, which causes hypophosphatemia. Um, your serum calcium, it's going to attempt to maintain it. Uh, but eventually serum calcium also starts to fall. So there's low serum calcium, low serum phosphate, poor bone mineralization, and hypophosphatemia. And there's increased phosphate in the urine. So it's important to remember in this case, because the calcium is low, it causes a secondary elevation in the PTH, which will then cause the increased excretion of phosphate, uh, hypophosphatemia, poor mineralization, and all those consequences of, uh, you know, poor calcium. This is a slide which basically summarizes everything. Uh, the top portion here talks about the vitamin D effect on uh, the bone, the gut, the kidneys, blood vessels. This talks about the effect of PTH 
on the various organs, bones, kidneys, blood vessels, etc. Um, and finally, there is calcitonin, which is another hormone, which we didn't discuss, but I believe uh, you guys have taken it in MSK. And finally, the very last slide of this lecture, osteoporosis. This is the only thing we're going to be talking about for osteoporosis. This is the last slide. Um, so what happens in osteoporosis? There is a loss of bone mineral density. It starts with loss of trabecular bone. As you can see here, the normal cortical bone can be seen on the outside edges over here. Then within, you have the trabecular bone, right? In osteoporosis, the trabecular bone is the first to go. And this is the femur of the patient. Trabecular bone is basically gone. It's like holes in the trabecular bone. And so because there's a decreased trabecular bone, eventually also decreased cortical bone, this means the bone is a lot weaker. The most important function of trabecular bone was resisting tensile forces, right? But if the trabecular bone is decreased, if it's just gone, it's just gone, um, the bone is less uh, resilient. It is less strong. It can't resist the forces as well as it used to, which does what? Weakens the bone, increases risk of fractures. And that is all. I'm so sorry for taking so long. It took 11 minutes over time. I hope that's okay. Um, but we're finally done. Um, yeah, that's it. I hope you guys uh, understood everything. If you guys have any questions, uh, please let me know. My email is also on um, the first side of this PowerPoint. So if you guys have any questions, just, uh, just feel free to email me. Um, I will always get back to you as soon as possible. And good luck in your exam. Good luck in your OSPI. Inshallah, all of you would do really, really great. Um, inshallah, it will be really easy. And that's it. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, uh, so should I just leave? I'll leave. Yep, sure. All right. Bye-bye.